Thank you very much. So um, again, I'm Giancarlo Guizzardi. I'm a professor at the uh, Free University of Bolton, Bolzano in the north of Italy, and uh, also at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. And the, the idea here today is to give you a, an overview about a number of uh, technologies, let's say, that we have been developing for uh, ontology-driven conceptual modeling, namely the Unified Foundation Ontology, UFO, uh, a version, a, let's say, semantic web-oriented version of UFO called uh, GUFO or uh, GUFO, and uh, a modeling language, an ontology-driven conceptual modeling language called uh, ONTUML. So conceptual modeling is the activity of representing the physical or social world for the purpose of communication, problem solving, and mini negotiation among humans. Right? So according to this definition, so this definition makes it clear that conceptual modeling can be seen as a kind of interface between reality and cognition. Right? So it's a representation of aspects of reality such that humans can uh, do communication, domain understanding and problem solving with, uh, with these representations. The connection between, let's say, conceptual modeling and reality uh, is something that it's actually, it's been discussed since the beginning of the era of conceptual modeling. In fact, in, the, in this paper from 1967, uh, George Milley, so George Milley is the creator of Milley Automata. He was the PhD supervisor of Peter Chang uh, who's the creator of ER diagrams. So George Billy is in a sense the grandfather of, uh, of conceptual modeling. In this paper in 67, he uh, defends explicitly this idea that data are fragments of a theory of the real world. And data representation, data processing, uh, basically juggles representations of these theories. And that the issue this issue is one of ontology or the question of what exists, right? So he explicitly defends that creating these theories, data representations as theory of the real world, theories about the real world is an issue of ontology in the philosophical sense. He goes on citing this paper by, by Quine, this book by, by the philosopher William Van Orman Quine. And why is this the case? It's because, you know, if you take any representation artifact, any information artifact that has uh, real world semantics, in other words, which is not just uh, a piece of mathematics, this thing necessarily commits to a kind of theory of the real world, makes an ontological commitment. So if, if we take even, a, you know, the most mundane uh, database talking about transplants, for example, this database commits to a worldview that includes concepts like people who can believe in or deceased, transplants, and the ways of, of people participating in transplants as surgeons, donors, donees, and so on. So what, what Millie was, uh, was trying to say, and I fully uh, endorse and agree, is that the, there is no way out of this. So the opposite of ontology is actually Known on, it's not known ontology, just bad ontology, because you're doing ontology work anyway. Every time you create any artifact who has this purpose of representing aspects of the real world, you are doing some work in ontology very often without the proper uh, tools. So we've been busy for quite some time on time trying to uh, use these notions on, on doing good ontology uh, and providing tools for doing good ontology by leveraging on this 2,400 years of, uh, of uh, ontology work done in philosophy, but then again in cognitive science, in linguistics, in philosophical logics, and so on. So ontology in this original sense can be seen as a kind of calculus of content. Right, so systems of uh, a prioristic systems of categories and ties addressing general issues like identity, parthood, taxonomic structures, dependence, different types of dependence, events, how objects relate to events, and so on. So this is the the area of formal ontology in in philosophy, and this is used to do this work on uh, conceptual clarification and ontological analysis, so understanding the aspects of reality before we can represent them in terms of artifacts. And the area of ontology-driven conceptual modeling is this discipline that uh, draws 
from from this uh, leverage on this work on this theoretical basis done in in uh, in philosophy, as I said, and cognitive science and linguistics and so on, to develop tools, engineering tools for creating these artifacts, which are supposed to represent the results of this kind of ontological analysis. We've been busy doing exactly that for quite some time. So uh, we, for the past 20 years, we've been working on developing these theories. So taking these things from philosophy and adapting to, uh, to address the specific goals of conceptual modeling or data modeling in, in, uh, in computer science. So uh, this materialized as a particular foundation ontology called the UFO, the Unified Foundation Ontology, which is a system of micro theories dealing with all these different aspects of conceptual modeling. Again, classification, taxonomic structures, partial relations, causality, multi-level modeling, dependency, events, roles, and so on. And once we have this series, as I mentioned before, in this, since this is an engineering project as well, we, we use this series to develop a number of uh, engineering tools. Uh, and the, the purpose of this talk today is uh, giving you an overview about these different tools based on these foundational theories. So tools uh, like modeling language, methodologies, computational tools for model creation, verification, validation, and so on. Um, patterns, anti-patterns, code generators, simulators, complexity management tools, and so on. In particular, uh, what I'll be talking about today will uh, be centered around this, this modeling language called uh, OntoUML, uh, an ontologically uh, well-founded version of UML um, in the following sense, that modeling primitives of this language reflect the ontological distinctions put forth by this ontology and the formal constraints, formal constraints are added to the grammar of this language such that it, you can only build models in ontoml which are conformant with the axiomatization of this underlying ontology. So we derive semantically oriented in syntactical constraints which are included in the language from the axiomatization of the underlying ontology. Once we have these tools, we can build uh, models, domain-specific theories in several domains. And I'll just give you two examples of clusters of models we have been developing in several domains. So for example, in the area of software engineering, we have a network of domain ontologies or domain reference conceptual models in software engineering, dealing with, for example, configuration management, software adaptation requirements, software defects and anomalies and so on. And this materialize as this network of models called CIOM, Software Engineering Ontology Network. And uh, another area in which we have been doing uh, work in, in this direction and creating this federation of models that are now becoming a kind of network of models as well is in the area, let's say, of microeconomics, dealing with phenomena like service, value, economic transactions, trust, contracts, economic preference, money, risk, and so on. And then once we have this domain ontology, we can also design evaluate re-engineering domain uh, specific languages. And we have been doing this also for many uh, enterprise modeling languages like, uh, like for example, Archimate. So in several occasions, we propose change to Archimate, some of which uh, made into the standard were accepted as, uh, as change to be made in the standard. Uh, UFO, this underlying ontology got uh, an interesting uh, attention, momentum in, in the area of conceptual modeling. So this is a paper published uh, at ER 2016, in which the authors analyzed uh, these different ontologies which are used in conceptual modeling. And uh, in that occasion, UFO was the second most used uh, foundational ontology, um, just behind BWW, which is this Pioneer work by uh, Ron Weber and uh, Yeah You Want, adapting the, the ontology of the, of the um, philosopher Mario Bunge. But something that made us uh, quite surprised and, and, and happy is that they also show that since the adoption, since uh, you know, uh, the introduction of UFO in 2005, UFO grows as much as BWW. Uh, let's say decrease in adoption in the sense that many people clearly are moving from uh, BWW to UFO. This makes us happy because it gives us 
data as well, right? So uh, I'll, I'll come back to this because uh, once we have a, a community of people working with this ontology and with the tools which are derived from this ontology, we can also learn from this experience and keep evolving uh, this, this entire ecosystem. So uh, this is just, you know, if people want to know more about UFO, there is a paper we published a few years ago at, uh, at Applied Ontology that gives the whole uh, rationale and, and, uh, and history of the, of the ontology. And uh, this is still the main uh, reference to uh, onto UML. So this book that describes how these different theories, also there are a number of papers here uh, addressing specific issues and how these different theories of UFO have been used to address classical conceptual modeling problems, some of which I'll mention today, and, uh, and redesign these uh, tools in the language. So this should give you a, a primer, a very quick uh, overview of what this, uh, what ONTO-UML looks like. So ONTO-UML is UML in a sense. As I said, it's an extension of UML uh, in, including primitives that reflect these ontological distinctions and including constraints that follow uh, from the underlying axiomatization. So if we just take this taxonomic uh, aspects and classes, uh, unlike UML or ER or ORM that, that have this, just this general notion of class or type, here we make a distinction between types of types. So we make a distinction between kinds of things so kinds are types which classify, which describe essential properties to their instance and classify, and hence classify uh, their instance in a, uh, in a necessary way, in a rigid way, in a static way. So for example, I'm necessarily a person. So the type person describes all properties that I must have in order to exist. And here in this uh, toy model, we have four kinds of things we have people, hearts, brains, and organizations. I'm necessarily a person, but I'm only contingently a living person or an adult person. So types like a living person or deceased person or child and adult, these are dynamic types. Dynamic types that classify contingent classification conditions, which are uh, related to intrinsic changes in their instance. So I, C should be an adolescent, a teenager, and become an adult because something internal to me changes. Right? Likewise, uh, the, universe, the, the universe of Twente is necessarily an organization, but it's only contingently an active organization. Could uh, hope it doesn't happen, but it could, in theory, in the future, become an extinct organization. So, being an extinct or uh, active organization are, again, dynamic types describing contingent properties of entities of the kind of organization. As I said, what we call phases are dynamic types which are related to intrinsic properties, but we also have dynamic types which are related to relational properties. So I'm, I'm an employee. So an employee is an adult living person. It's contingent. No employee is necessarily an employee. So it's a contingent property, but it's a contingent pro property whose um, dynamic classification condition is a relational one. In order to be an employee, I need to have a contract with an employer. In order to be a customer, I have to buy a product or service from a, from a supplier. In order to be a father, I need to have an offspring. In order to be a husband, I have to have a spouse and so on, right? And we also have a distinction between independent entities like people, hearts, brains, and organizations and dependent entities. So my employment is something which can only exist if I exist and the University of Twente exists or the University of Bolzano exists, two different employments. Um, my marriage can only exist if I exist and my wife exists, exists right? So this is a kind of uh, dependent object which here is called a relator. These things, so all these distinctions that I mentioned between kinds, phases, and roles, for example, they also apply to dependent things. So for example, my marriage is necessarily a marriage, but it's only contingently a marriage with a partial separation of assets. It could become a, a marriage with full separation of assets. And it's only contingently a marriage which is legally accepted in Sweden, right? So it's a role played by the marriage itself a dynamic and relational property of the marriage. The marriage is 
which is contingently legally accepted in Sweden, by having a kind of acceptance acknowledgement relation to, to a particular jurisdiction in Sweden. We also have all these different distinctions I'm talking about here. These are model distinctions, right? So we also have model distinctions uh, between relations. So for example, in, and in particular, partial relations. So onto ML will distinguish uh, this, these two types of relations here, which are collapsed in one single type in UML. For example, the relation I have with my heart is completely different from the relation I have with my brain. The former, the relation between the person and the person's heart is one which is called generic dependence. Every person must have a heart, but it doesn't have to be the same heart in all possible situations. While every person must have that particular brain. So it's not generic dependence, it's specific dependence. Only in the second case, we have um, life, uh, life cycle dependence, right? And the same holds from the part to the whole as well. The heart must be connected to a person, but it doesn't have to be the same person, while the brain must be connected, must be part of that particular person. So specific dependence from the whole to the part, it's called uh, essential parthood. Specific dependence from the part to the whole is called inseparable parthood. So again, these are model distinctions and they interact in interesting way with the model distinctions among types of types. So if I could offer a geometric metaphor, Imagine that our universe is tessellated in kinds. So everything belongs to one kind in exactly one kind and cannot move out of the borders of the boundaries of that kind. So for example, suppose these are organization and these are people. Phases and roles, which are kind of, uh, it's called anti-rigid sort of, I'll come back to this. This can be thought as shadows moving classifying and declassifying things within the borders of a kind, right? We're never crossing the borders of a kind. So suppose the red one here is student, classifying and declassifying people. And what are called mixings, uh, they are exactly those types which cross the borders of kinds, which classify things of multiple kinds. We can have rigid mixings, and we can have anti-rigid mixings or dynamic mixings, right? So shadows crossing the borders of kinds, classifying and declassifying things. So here we have a tiny piece of the UFO ontology of types. So a type can be either a sorto, and a sorto is either a kind or a specialization of a kind, right? It's one of those regions or something within a particular region. And a mixing is something which classifies things of multiple kinds, in other words, which crosses uh, boundaries. What can we do with that? Right? One, of, one of the issues is uh, justifying how these different types here, what is the relation between this particular individual, Pelé, and all these different types here. From a logical point of view, all these different types are just unary predicates. However, from an ontological point of view, they are very different. And the relation of classification is a very different one, right? So all these things in different worlds apply to this individual Pelé. But for example, in 1950, Pelé was Brazilian, was a person and was a man. In 1970, he, was, he became an adult, right? And a football player. In 1994, he was also an actor as a husband and a father in 2020, and, and he was also the Minister of Sports in Brazil. In 2020, he's no longer a football player nor a Minister of Sports or, a, or an actor. So here, all these different things, all these different notions are general terms in the domain and unary predicates from a, a, a logical point of view. However, they describe very different ontological properties. So these distinctions, they embed certain methodological guidelines. So by asking questions like, uh, does this type classify uh, its instances necessarily or, or not? Um, if not, is the change relate, related to a, an intrinsic or relational property? If to a relational property, which relational property and so on? So the, meta pro the formal meta properties that make those distinctions also give us methodological guidelines for deciding 
how to model these terms that I find in the description of my subject domain by answering these questions, right? So I can justify that in my conceptualization, person is a kind because it's a rigid sort of, it's a rigid type that only classifies things of the same kind. That role, that, sorry, that minister of sports, football player, actor and husband are roles because they are dynamic, anti-rigid and relationally dependent. That living person or adult men are phases because they are anti-rigid but relationally independent. And that types like a cultural heritage entity, which would uh, classify Pelé, but also, you know, Brasilia and uh, the Coliseum and so on, um, are big scenes because they classify things of multiple kinds, like cities and people and events or dances and food and so on. Right? So this, this is a, this is something that happens very, very often in taxonomic structures that we want to guarantee the consistency of taxonomic structures. So I'll just use another example here. This comes from a paper from 1985 by uh, Ron Brackman, Richard Fikes, and Hector Levesque, which are, you know, uh, Ron Brackman is the, propo the, the, the proponent of KL1, which is the grandfather of OWL, for example. And in this paper, they, they ask this question, how many kinds of rock do we have here? And the conclusion they reach in the paper is that this is too uh, dangerous a question to be asked, that we shouldn't ask this question because, uh, because it's very hard to answer this. Because from, if you look from a logical point of view, you can generate the combinatorial explosion of all logical combinations of these properties here. That's the point, point they were making. The point I'd like to, to make is the exact opposite, that this is a fundamental question, and this can be easily answered once we have the ontological support that we just saw. So geologists would easily answer that we have three kinds of rocks here, right? Igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rock. That rock, therefore, is a category, is a type of mixing, a rigid mixing, because it classifies things of multiple kinds. That being a large rock, or a gray rock, let, I will assume that these are phases. Why? Because I'm assuming, and this is making explicit my conceptualization, that rocks can change size by erosion, for example, and that they can change uh, color also due to some physical chemical process. And uh, sorry, that uh, this would make, so large rock and gray rock would be a phase mixing because they would be anti-rigid relationally independent, but classifying things of multiple kinds. So both an igneous rock or a sedimentary rock would, could be a large rock, but gray sedimentary rock is a phase, right? Because it's only classified things of one kind with sedimentary rock. And the same for uh, igneous rock. Large gray igneous rock would be a phase because it would be a conjunction of two phase mixings and uh, in the intersection classifying things of one single kind with an igneous rock. So here is a very concrete example of how uh, we can uh, organize these taxonomic structures just by reasoning with, with this kind of meta properties and with this kind of distinctions. Moreover, we can now find out if we mean the same thing by this concept. Suppose Paul, for example, has an ontology in geology, but for him, being a large rock or a gray rock would be a rigid type, right? So our concept of gray rock and his concept of gray rock would be different because they would be represented by different uh, onto UML uh, primitives, although they are mapped to the same class in language like UML or first order logics, right? And here we still have that a pet, pet metamorphic rock is a role because a pet rock is a rock that I use as a pet, like a paperweight, for example, in their example. So again, classifying things of a single kind, metamorphic rock, contingent and relational. You know, it's a relational property to be a pet of someone. So a notion like this one, like this one of role that I just mentioned, it, it embeds a number of assumptions, right? So a role, the, the notion of role in ONTML basically represents a micro theory in UFO of what roles are, 
So for UFO, rows are types such that all instances of that type are of the same kind. They are sort of. So for example, all students are people. All instances of a row instantiate that type only contingently. So for example, no student is a student is necessarily a student. So entities can move in and out of the extension of student without losing their identity, without ceasing to exist. Instance of a kind instantiates a role when participating in a given relational context. So for example, in order to be a student, you have to be enrolled in an educational institution. So these are all constraints, right? Coming from the theory and that govern the behavior of this primitive in the language. We have some less obvious constraints like this one, that a role cannot be a super type of a rigid type. In fact, no anti-rigid type can be a super type of a rigid type. And I can show you why this is the case. So, and uh, take this, this example of a model in which we have customer as a super type of person. And customer is clearly a role and person is clearly a kind. Uh, you think that you know, people will never do this, but people do this all the time because they want to represent things like that, right? That customers can be people or organizations. So they use this construction to represent a kind of disjoint uh, type of uh, role playing or, or classification. Well, it's very easy to show that if you do something like this, you run into a logical contradiction. So suppose we have here that customer is a super type of person. Because of the semantics of super typing, we have that every instance of person is an instance of customer. Now, because customer is dynamic, it's anti-rigid, by definition, if X is an instance of customer in world W, there is another world W prime in which X ceases to be an instance of customer, right? A counterfactual world. However, because person is rigid, it means that every instance of person is necessarily an instance of person. So if X is an instance of person in, in world W, it's an instance of person in world W prime as well. However, since every instance of person is an instance of customer due to uh, subtyping or supertyping, uh, we have a contradiction because then X is, is and isn't an instance of customer in world W prime. So every time we take a dynamic type and put it as a super type of, a, of a static or rigid type, we get into a logical contradiction. So I can take these constraints here coming from the, the theory and include them as constraints in the language, in the grammar of the language, as synthetical constraints. So these, for example, become synthetically in, incorrect models in non -TML. So I cannot have a free floating role without the kind that give the identity to instance of that role. I cannot have a role as a super type of kind. I also cannot have a role participation, participate in a relation such that the opposite association end of that relation has a minimum cardinality of zero because participating in that relation is part of the definition of a role, right? Students cannot study in zero to many education institution because being enrolled in an education institution is part of the very definition of what it is to be a student. Then what I can do with that is that I can include these constraints in the meta model or in the grammar description of this language, such that models that break these rules become synthetically incorrect models, right? So that's what we did. I mean, we can come here and this tool will check if these constraints are broken. So for example, I click here and the tool will tell me that here I break one of these rules that I have a kind specializing in another kind, which you can't have in UML, or that I have a, a role here that doesn't specialize eventually a kind that would provide the identity for that entity. So this model would be, these models which break these ontological rules, they would be, uh, they wouldn't compile, right? So what we are doing is exactly what natural language does, which take semantic constraints that exist for ontological reasons and include the synthetical grammatical constraints in the language, right? So for example, that's why we cannot say there were five reds in the kitchen last night unless by red we mean, uh, we nominalize the adjective. We, we use red as a noun, right? Red as an adjective would make this sentence incorrect. And the reason is an ontological one, but we don't have to know that. 
the people the the competent speakers of english doesn't uh, do, do not have to know these ontological rules they just have to obey the grammar of english and that's what we are trying to do here so having this is already something that helps a lot in building of the models but we can do better right so instead of thinking that there are a number of things we cannot do due to these ontological constraints we could realize that there are actually few things we can do given the ontological constraints. So having a language, a modeling language that is not ontologically neutral, we have the fact that the modeling primitives of this language will not be um, lower granularity primitives like class or relation or attribute and so on. There will be higher granularity primitives which are cluster of concepts, right? The underlying axiomatization will make, will decrease the degree of freedom that we have in using this construct. So these constructs can only appear combined with other constructs forming a cluster of concepts or forming a pattern. So this is an example for the case of role. So every time you have a role, it has to eventually specialize one unique kind, and it has to be uh, defined in the scope of a relation such that the opposite the minimum cardinality of the opposite association end of that relation must be at least one. Analogous for phases. So if we have a phase, this is a phase of a unique kind. And because I can always move out of that phase, but I cannot move, to, move out of that kind, I have to move in into another phase of the same kind. So phase will always appear in this generalization sets which are disjoint and complete. So what we did was taking advantage of this, build a language that is a pattern language. So the actual primitives of uh, ontml are patterns. And you can build models by instantiating patterns. Here is an example of a more sophisticated pattern that would address the problem that we just saw. We saw that we cannot do this, right? Because we run into a logical contradiction. This is also not an alternative, right? So we cannot put person and organization as sub kind of customer, but we, can, we also cannot put person and organization as super type of customers. Why? Because as we saw, all kinds are mutually disjoint, which means their intersection is empty. So this model is basically saying there are no customers, right? You're saying every instance of customer is both a person and organization. There isn't anything that is a person and organization. Therefore, this class must be empty. How can we solve this problem? We solve this problem by realizing that customer, although it sounds like a role, it's actually one of those mixing entities, mixing types, because the whole problem is that it crosses the boundaries of kinds. In other words, it classifies things of multiple kinds. Once we realize that, we can basically specialize customer in things which are now sortals, which are types that only take as instance things of a unique kind. In this case, it's very easy. So I specialize customer here in personal customer and in corporate customer. The former is such that all its instances are people. The latter is such that all its instances are organizations. And I can always do this for this problem of finding how, how I relate things that look like roles, but that can be played by things of multiple kinds in taxonomic structures. I have a pattern and I can always apply this pattern in these situations. And then what we can do is to build a tool and this is the, uh, you know, the older interface of our tool, but uh, it shows this, this principle. I can build a tool that would instantiate models by instantiating patterns, right? So here I have person is a kind, deceased person is a phase. So if there is a phase, there should be at least another phase of the same kind. I'll do this again with, uh, with organization. Organization is a kind. And then I say that an active organization is a phase of organizations. Again, if it is a phase, there should be at least one other phase of organizations, extinct organization. And then I instantiate this other pattern. Now for a more interesting pattern, I have the row mixing here is so I, I'm saying that uh, personal customers are role played by living people. Corporate customers are roles played by active organizations. The role mixing as we saw is customer, 
the relational context here is, uh, is a service contract and the complementary role is a supplier, which is also played by active organizations. And then we instantiate this pattern. And uh, here we have a model, it's a small model, but it's not a trivial model. Actually, most people will get this wrong. And uh, we instantiate this model just by instantiating these three patterns. We actually, one thing we did was to show that ONTOML is a pattern grammar, right? That the primitives are these patterns and we can, we can uh, instantiate all models by, by concatenating the instantiation of this pattern. So if people are interested, we have a formalization of this idea of ONTOML as a pattern grammar. And this defines an alternative syntax for the language which is independent of the, of the UML meta model, right? So the abstract syntax here is defined as a set of graph rewriting rules. And using this uh, notion of graph rewriting rules, we've, we've been um, applying this uh, graph transformations, for example, for dealing with another problem, which is a very important problem and very neglected problem in conceptual modeling, which is complexity management of large conceptual models, right? So if you have very large models and we, because we, we did many projects with, uh, with uh, you know, real world settings with government and with organizations and so on, we found models that are very large and people couldn't understand these models. So uh, what we did was to, to use these ontological notions also to provide complexity management mechanisms for these large models. So even a model like this, um, which it, this is a UML model, it's a small model, it's not a large model at all. But for example, if we had to modularize this model, it's not obvious the best way to do it. So let, let's look at this uh, from an ONTOML perspective now. And I'll just mention one of these complexity management uh, techniques. We did others. One we did was called uh, viewpoint extraction or breaking down of the model. So we can automatically take a model like this and break it down in a number of viewpoints that we see separately, the kinds and the subkind structures and what are the roles and what are the kinds of things which can play the roles, what are the relational contexts, what are the, the mixings into we see the kinds of things which are classified by those mixings and so on. So this is viewpoint extraction. I won't be able to go into this. Another thing we did was abstraction or model summarization, which is we take a model like this and we generate a summary of this model, which really captures the gist of what the model is about. So this is the summary of that model with three classes, right? And by looking at this, we can immediately understand what this domain is about and what are the central classes of this domain, right? So imagine if we have a 500 classes a diagram and we want to generate a 20 or 30 classes model, but which really captures the gist of what the model is about. I'll mention a little bit with more detail, a third technique, which is modularization. And what we did with modularization, again, is rely on some of these ontological notions. By the way, this doing these complexity management tools for large models in a language like UML or ER is very, very hard, exactly because those languages are ontologically neutral. So in other words, those languages take all classes as the same. They have the same importance, all classes and all relations, right? So the only thing you can do is basically rely on topological properties of the graph. But this is a very crude way of doing this. So for example, if you take the class in which you have more arrows arriving at that class, so a version of page rank, if you like. But this is very crude because some of this very important class, they'll be very higher up in the hierarchy. Everything would derive their principles of identity from that, but in the essential properties uh, from that class, but that class is not directly connected to many classes, right? Here, instead, in ONTOML, because we have this kind of ontological semantics, when building the model, the, the modeler is basically telling you what are the most important classes, right? And, and we can leverage on that. So we can leverage on this notion of kinds to do this kind of abstraction, and we can leverage on this notion of relators to find a context which are relational contexts. 
right? So we, we of course have a paper on this. If people are interested, I can, I, can, I can give you the paper. But the idea here is imagine if we take someone's life and we break down the, uh, a person's life as an example in different relational contexts. So for example, I'm a professor in, in, uh, in Twente, I'm a professor in Bolzano. So these are two different contexts. In those contexts, I have different rights and obligations. I teach different courses. I have different projects. I have different supervisions. Then I'm a father. Um, I'm a husband. I have a Brazilian citizenship and an Italian citizenship. All these things are different contexts. Right? And there are many relations which are, uh, so these contexts are maximal cuts in my life in which everything else de depend on, 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 some, on some relational notion there, but which is kind of disjoint from these other relational notions. So here we take, for example, these relators like the marriage. And what we do is we navigate from the relator to the rows up into we find, we guarantee that the all roles in that context have a principle of identity uh, ascribed to them. So in this case, into we reach the level of the kinds of things which can play those roles. Same thing here for car ownership. We navigate here and we find what are the roles of the things which can be involved in those relational contexts. Here's an employment, same thing. And here's a more interesting example because we involve certain row mix scenes. So what we do is we go to this row mix scenes, we go down until we reach these rows, and then we go up until we find again the kinds that would provide the principle of identities for all roles in those relational contexts. And then by doing that, we can just break down that model in a number of modules that reflect that take the name from the relator, from the focal relator, and that reflect the different aspects which are being treated in that model. And this can be done in an extremely, uh, in a deterministic way, and in an extremely uh, efficient way from a computational point of view, even with really large model, models. So we test this with models with 15,000 classes, for example. Now, another thing you can do is, uh, once we have the conceptual model, to create a number of different uh, codifications of, of those models, right? So, uh, as we all know, conceptual modeling, in when doing conceptual modeling or while doing conceptual modeling, we are trying to maximize truthfulness to the domain being represented, expressivity, and let's say pragmatic efficiency, comprehensibility appropriateness, as it is called. You know, these models must be efficient, pragmat pragmatically efficient for humans to use them in tests like domain understanding, communication, problem solving, meaning negotiation, and so on. But once we have that model, we very often want to create implementations of those models. And from the same conceptual model, we can create different implementations, satisfying different sets of non-functional requirements, right? And that's why we have design. So what we did is from not... The whole community has been working on this and people have proposed mappings from onto UML, for example, to different languages, including some of these languages uh, in the semantic web. So there are mappings to relational databases uh, with some interesting properties, by the way, um, with uh, to mapping to uh, object-oriented languages, to uh, modal prologue, to small talk, to uh, JavaScript and so on and also to some uh, semantic web languages, uh, for example, uh, OWL. So uh, the, here we have, a, we have a challenge actually, because not only we have different levels of logical expressivity in a language like ContuML and OWL, um, but it's, it's, not, it's basically impossible to maintain the same expressivity as we translate this to OWL. And there are several ways of doing this, right? So for example, just to, to, to mention one example, uh, as we saw many of these notions in OTML, which are essential for ontology, are modal notions. But how do you represent this in a language like OWL that doesn't have any notion of, uh, of temporal modality, uh, and also a language in which you cannot use the, the old AI trick of just including an extra parameter uh, for time? In, in the relations, I cannot say 
John is a student at T1 and John is an employee at T2. You could do that, but I cannot say John is married to Mary at T1 and John is married to Clara at T2 because I can only have binary relations in now. So I cannot have this ternary predicate which time uh, time indexed. So it's not trivial how to do that, but we, we spent quite some time doing that. And we, we have a number of transformation patterns that once we have uh, a ontario ML model and you select certain non-functional requirements or certain parameters that you want to address, uh, you can generate uh, the code, the particular type of code or transformation to all. So, we, Again, this is implemented in the tool, so we can come here and, uh, and we have some methodological guidelines on which transformation to select. And once we, we select the transformation, it just generates uh, code in, the, in this language. And then you can use your favorite OWL tool to you know, reason with that and uh, do automated reasoning with, with this OWL version of that original ontology or that original conceptual model. In particular, recently, what we did was to propose a OWL version of the unified foundation ontology called uh, GUFO. So GUFO stands for, G, uh, for gentle UFO. It's also a joke because GUFO in Italian means OWL. So, what we did is here we have a total uh, uh, a representation of the taxonomy uh, behind UFOs. So for here, for example, we have the domain concepts like person or um, organization, and there is specialization of this notion of functional complex in UFO, basically objects which are not quantities nor collectives. But then we also have that uh, the whole taxonomy of UFO types here. So at the same time, we have that uh, person. So it's a, what is called punny in an owl. We have the type, the domain type person as an instance of kind in UFO, but we have that Mary and John are instances of this type person. And when we generate this owl code, we can reason at the same time with the with, with these two notions or with these two levels, right? So we have that John is a person and that person is a, a type of functional complex of, of this type of object in UFO, right? That child is a subclass of person, but that child is a phase in UFO. And then we can implement in UFO, uh, implement in, the, in, the, in tools, some, some ways, some plugins that can check those constraints that we saw before, that a role cannot be a super type of a kind and so on. So this will be a way of building uh, ontologically consistent taxonomies also in, in our. Now, um, a, a third topic I'd like to address here is this topic of, uh, of validation. So validation is something which is extremely important in ontology. Uh, in ontologists, also because ontologists are supposed to, one of the clearer applications of ontologies or reference conceptual models is this topic of interoperability, right? So you're using these models to calculate relations between different uh, worldviews. Validation is very different from the task of verification, and verification is what is, uh, let's say, supported by, by most of these tools, including these OWL tools like Protege. So verification is checking uh, if you got the model right. Validation is checking if you got the right model. So the former is basically checking logical consistency, satisfiability, and so on. The latter is checking if the model you have is the model you should have. So it's the model that really represents your conceptualization or your worldview. So we can understand this relation um, by looking at these two sets. So here on the left, I have the set of valid instance of that model, let's say, the valid state of affairs according to the representation. So the, the types of populations or configurations which are accepted by my given representation, right? So I have a, a, mo a model, a, a UML model, which can be taught as a kind of logical theories. So here we have the logical models of that theory. On the, on the right, on the set B, I have the intended 
state of affairs according to my conceptualization. So the intended models of the theory, right? Ideally, they should be the same, but frequently our models are under constraint. So for example, I leave out axioms or formal constraints that I should include in the model. And therefore my model will accept as possible instances, instances which are not intended. I can also do the opposite. I can do over constraining. So I, I include constraints that I'm not, that without uh, me realizing these constraints are excluding things that are intended. So out rule interpretations, which are intended. So we can talk, think about this as interpretations as well, right? So SETA is the set of possible interpretations that would be valid according to that description, that representation, and the set B, B are the intended interpretations. The task of doing conceptual modeling or the, doing reference conceptual modeling is to find out the exact set of constraints that would make these two things match. A conceptual model is a structure plus an axiomatization, right? And what I'm defending here is that this, this axiomatization, structure plus additional axiomatization, is the description of my ontological commitment. So the only way these conceptual models can be used in interoperability, in putting together systems which have been developed in an autonomous concurrent way, is this, if these models really serve as contracts, right? If they are really to be taken as the representation of what, what is my conceptualization of that domain. So they are the representation of my ontological commitment. And due to a number of cognitive um, biases that we have and cognitive limitations, it's basically impossible for us, for humans, to create models in any sufficient complex domain and realize what the model is saying on their behalf, realize what that contract is saying on their behalf. So part of these constraints are, in the case of FontUML, they, they come for free. So they basically come from, as I said before, these patterns are representations of micro theories in UFO. So once I use the patterns, I'm importing this axiomatization, right? So it's a theory inclusion mechanism. So if I use a row pattern like this, I'm importing this axiomatization that says every person is necessarily a person. Every student can cease to be a student. Every student is a person. A student is, is a person that is enrolled in an education institution and so on, right? So you're constraining already the set of possible interpretations, right? So I cannot have one here in which people can see should be a, a person or that students are not enrolled in education institutions. These interpretations are uh, excluded. And, and this, is, uh, this is interesting because by, again, by using uh, onto ML, we are importing already a lot of this exomatization. However, since the ontoml is a general purpose conceptual modeling language, it cannot know about constraints which are domain specific. So the problem is how do I include domain specific constraints, right? So what we did was to uh, come up with an approach based on, on simulation. And what we do is to, we basically uh, extended um, a language called Alloy and its system. We basically implemented a kind of model semantics using Alloy and uh, configured in a certain way the, uh, the, this tool called the Alloy Analyzer. And what we, we have in the end is that this is kind of an execution semantics for the model. So we take the model and this tool will generate the possible interpretations of that model, right? In a finite context. Um, so it generates what this model is saying on your behalf. So when I look at, the, at a model like this, this is a very simple model in which I have one kind, one relator with a transplant and three rows. That's what we saw in the beginning, right? This model does not break any of those general, the general UFO rules. So I don't have free floating rows. I don't have a role as a super type of a kind. I don't have uh, wrong cardinality constraints here. I don't have anything like that. So the verification step that I showed you before, uh, this model would pass on verification. Now, if I, in order to, the, the question is, 
Is this the correct model, the model that really represents the interpretations I want for this domain? So again, when simulating the so that I can have a transplant with a donor, a donee, and three surgeons. But as the modeler iterates, iterates through the results of the simulation, this will um, pop up. So this is a transplant in which I'm donating an organ to myself and perform the transplant. So the person, the same person playing the three roles in the transplant. This is one in which you have uh, someone donating an organ to someone else and perform the transplant. This is one in which I'm donating, for example, the, an organ to myself and someone else performing the transplant and so on. So these are all possible interpretations of that model, uh, but which are not intended, right? And once, uh, you know, I test this several times with, with students and so on, and it, the first reaction people have when looking at this to rectify the model is to define the three roles as mutually disjoint. But once you do this, you are now over constraining the model. So what you have is that someone who's a donor will never become, or someone who's a donee will never be a donor. And a surgeon can never be a donor and a donee. So the constraint you wrote is too, too uh, strong, right? So what you want to say is that these roles are mutually disjoint in the scope of the same transplant, not overall. So by playing the simulation game, including and excluding axioms, you can, uh, it's like running a series of experiments into you are convinced that that model, that contract really uh, represents your worldview. We did this for several, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, because ONTUML and you forgot uh, some attention and many people started using this, uh, this language, we managed to build a repository of uh, ONTUML models in several domains, right? So we had uh, nearly 60 models, uh, ranging from models that were coming from papers or from, from uh, theses to models that were built by organizations, by large organizations over, by professionals, teams of 15 people over two years with 5,000 concepts. So ranging both in the nature of the process in which they were produced, the size of the model. Some of the models had 15 classes, some had 4,000 or more than 4,000 classes, um, and, and ranging in a number of domains as well. So we had models that went from, uh, you know, procurement in government to, to biodiversity in the Amazon to optical networks and so on. So this was a very rich repository. So what we started doing was to use the simulation approach over this set of, of models in the repository. And in doing that, something very interesting happened, which, is, which was the following. We realized that there are certain structures that when present in these models, they would create, they would tend to create this dissociation between the set of valid interpretations and intended interpretations. In other words, error-prone structures in conceptual modeling or anti-patterns, right? So patterns that when present in model, they would tend to create these validation problems, right? So this is one example. This is one anti-pattern. Every time you have one relator with several roles, such that more than one of these roles take their identity from the same kind, of course, in the instance level, one possibility is to have the very same instance playing more than one of these roles. And we realize that this is typically not intended, right? So these are not uh, these are not proscriptions, right? Things which are necessarily wrong, because if they were, we could just include these as constraints in the meta model and outrule this as valid constructions, right? But they are more like cold spells. They are the model equivalent of cold spells. They are things which are typically wrong, but not necessarily wrong. So we have a catalog now uh, of a number of these anti-patterns. And once we have these anti-patterns, what we can do is to build in the tool a mechanism for proactively detecting these anti-patterns and suggesting changes or rectifications uh, to these anti-patterns. 
So just to give you an idea, in this repository, some of this, so the, the, this is one called relational specialization. So I have two types and two uh, specializations of those types. I have a relation between the original types and a relation between the, the specializations of those types. It's very often the case that there is a missing constraint between those two relations, right? So this is called a, a relation specialization and like that. We found in this repository 817 occurrences of the this anti pattern in half of the models. Uh, there is another one that's called association cycle. We found it in 1,800 occurrences in the repository in 92% of the models. And the one we saw now with the relators, we found it in 25% of the models in 149 instances. So every one of these instances is the model saying something on your behalf that you are not aware of. Right? And then what we did was to, because again, we don't know if these are errors, what we did was to take the, um, the, the largest model in this repository, which was a model with, uh, with more than nearly 5,000 concepts, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, what we did was to give this tool to the team that built that model, such that uh, we could watch and record how often they would, uh, so the tool would detect these anti patterns and how often they would say, they would consider these anti patterns as errors and they would accept our predefined solutions. Right? And here are some of the, of the data. So for example, for the transplant case, in 56% of the case, this was an error. We could automatically repair or detect or, or uh, correct the model in 77% of the cases. In the case of relation specialization, in almost 90% of the cases, it was really an error, an undesired, uh, representation and we could automatically correct almost in 100% of the cases and in the association cycle in 70% of the cases it was a, a, an error a real error and we could automatically correct in 71% of the cases now what is the next step and that's what we are doing now once we so the way we've built this uh, repository of uh, anti-patterns this catalog of anti-patterns was by uh, manually inspecting the models, simulating all the models and finding out the structures, investigating the models, investigating this, the relation between the shoe sets, identifying the structures and so on. So it was a manual process, right? The, the, set, of, uh, the set of valid interpretations would be given uh, by the simulation, but the set of intended interpretation was in the mind of the of the of the models so we had to check documentation interview people and so on so a very um time expensive and also error prone process because some of these models are quite large but then we realized something which is something that i'm quite uh, excited about which is the following that every time someone is simulating one of these models and is judging for each result, each instance of the simulation, if that is intended or not, or non-intended, the modeler is creating information, right? And the community of modeler, modelers uh, who are simulating all these different ontoml models, in every simulation, they are creating a very, very useful type of information, which was which we were losing, which we we're not doing anything with this information. In particular, there is a one uh, approach in machine learning, which is called uh, inductive logic programming, in which given that you have what's called the background theory and a set of positive and negative examples, uh, the, in the a inductive logic programming engine can try to learn what would be the repairment, the eventual repair to be done in the original theory, such that it, it would include all the positive examples as valid interpretations and exclude the, in, the negative examples as non-intended interpretations. Right? ILP never took off really because it's very hard to produce this base of positive and negative examples. But then we realized that our original model is the background theory. And every time someone is doing the simulation, this person is curating for us 
a database of positive and negative examples, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna show this process here with a very tiny example. So imagine if we have this tiny UML model uh, in which you have a person that can be a man or a woman. So the original theory is this one, right? Every woman is a person, every man is a person, very simple. If I simulate this in our tool, the tool will generate uh, all this possible instance, right? So here you have one man, one individual that is both a man and a woman, one person that is neither a man nor a woman, and so on. So you generate all these possible configurations. So the modeler would look at this and will mark, for example, that this is intended, this is unintended, that this is unintended, that this is intended, and so on. And then what this tool will do is to generalize this and find out what are the, that these are, what, what is unintended, the pattern of unintended, unintendedness is, the patterns are, you cannot have an instance of person which is not either a man or a woman, and you cannot have an instance of person who's both a man and a woman, according to this conceptualization. And the tool will learn what are the constraints that you have to include in the original model to exclude these two patterns or of unintended uh, situations. So now to, to summarize uh, this part regarding simulation, and, and, and again, this has this direct connection to this process of learning. Take a model like this. This is a, a non trivial model, a very simple one, um, one that doesn't contain any verification mistakes, right? So if I verify this model, there is no rule being broken here. Now, if I validate this model, or if I use the tool, uh, the, the anti-pattern detection service in the tool, the tool will detect almost 20 anti-patterns even in this very, very small toy example model of criminal investigation, right? I bet you can identify some of these already, right? So for example, here we have that both the suspect, the detective and the witness can be instantiated by the same person. So I can investigate myself and interrogate myself as a witness. But there are other examples, like for example, that you can have a detective that conducts an interrogation of an investigation, uh, and this detective is not connected to that investigation at all. So the detective conducts an interrogation of the investigation of which he's not part, right? So it's a problem with this association cycle and so on. So again, the tool would detect all these instances of these anti-patterns, um, would show me examples of these anti-patterns. So this is an example of the association cycle. Will show me that here I have this person is a detective uh, conducting this interrogation, but he's not part of the criminal investigation of, of which this interrogation is part. He's part of another criminal investigation. And once I um, accept, so for example, the tool will give me options for ratification. So this has to do with the other anti-pattern. So if I have the criminal investigation, the, the tool will show me that you can have the same individual instantiating the three roles, detective, witness, and and um, um, suspect, right? So it will give me several options of rectifying or correcting this model. So, for example, I can say that witness and detective are disjoint in the scope of a criminal investigation. That um, witness and suspect also must be disjoint in the scope of the of the same investigation. But that detective and suspect are overall disjoint. So, if you are suspecting a case, you cannot be a detective in another investigation. So it's a constraint that crosses, uh, cross cuts several relators. And once I select which ones I want to exclude, what the tool will do is to generate the constraints, the formal constraints, in this case in temporal OCL, that will be included here in the, in the, in the original model to exclude these unintended interpretations. So to wrap up, uh, I like very much this quote from, from Daniel Jackson. So the, Daniel Jackson is the, the, the creator of Alloy, the, the proponent of Alloy. And in his book, um, so first time I, I, I read his book, one of his books called uh, Software Abstractions, Logic, Language, and Analysis. Uh, this is something that uh, stood out, right? This paragraph. So he, he said, few modelers have the experience of subjecting their models to continue automatic review. 
building a model incrementally with an analyzer simulating and checking as you go along is a very different experience from using paper alone. The first reaction is one of amazement. And this is so true, right? So it's very different from building models just on paper, building models in a tool that gives you no formal support of verification. And it's also very different from verification, right? What, as I said before, what this does with the modeling language is creating an operational semantics for the modeling language, right? So people learn, what we observed is that people start learning conceptual modeling in a way that is similar to the way they learn how to program. Right? No one learns Java by reading the semantics of Java. I bet most Java programmers never even saw the, the, the semantic specification of Java. What people do is that they start writing code and running the code. And, and more importantly, taking code written by other people, tweaking, changing parts of the code and running again and again and again. Right? So every time this execution semantics of the programming language is what gives you the, uh, the understanding of what is the semantics of those constructs. And we, we observe the same behavior here in conceptual modeling. People would go to this repository and download onto your ML models and start messing with the stereotypes and changing things from face to roles and, and changing uh, the, the, the model constraints on the relations and so on and start simulating again. And they would, what we observe is that they would understand the language and the semantics of the language in a much deeper way by doing that. Then Daniel Jackson continues. So the first reaction tends to be amazement. Modeling is much more fun when you get this instance visual feedback. But then the sense of humiliation sets in, sets in as you discover that there is almost nothing you can do right. And I have, this sounds very uh, exaggerated, but I fully agree with him. I mean, after we did this uh, empirical work, looking at all these models in these repositories, and also, you know, we've been teaching um, OntoML using this tool for, for some time now, and it's basically impossible for people to, uh, to build any model that is not trivial without realizing that there are missing constraints or there are, uh, you know, exceeding constraints, right? So constraints that shouldn't be there. So it's basically impossible for us, given our cognitive uh, limitations, to think about all possible configurations of a conceptual model and how they evolve across possible worlds. We can, we simply cannot do that, right? It's uh, we are very, we are subject to things which are very um, similar. To, to some of cognitive bias that we have in general, like for example, the availability bias, right? So if I tell you something, you are gonna think about the canonical case of that, right? So if I give you a model with, so if I give a student with less experience a model with, with just person and one single relation saying, people can be married to zero to many people, they will think about the canonical case in which you have, you know, people married across time to several other people, but they will never imagine that this model would accept as a possible interpretation, I marry myself, I marry people who are already dead, I marry several people at the same time, some of which are already dead and so on, right? So it's very hard for us to think about these non-canonical cases. And my example with marriage is the simplest model you can have, right? With one class and one relation, but if you have a 5,000 classes model, how do you deal with that? Right? How do you think about the possible instance, the possible configurations, and the evolution of these things across uh, possible uh, worlds? So, if I, what I learned uh, with with this experience is that if we don't simulate these models, the models are are wrong. I mean, you can bet good money that the models are wrong in this in this validation sense. And of course, these things connect to each other. That. I mean, for us to validate, because validation depends on, on relating the possible interpretations to the intended ones, you need the user to understand the simulations. And if the models are very large, how do I understand the simulations if I cannot even understand the original model, right? So that's how uh, these complexity management tools can also help in this, uh, in this task of, uh, of validation. 
that's it for today. Thank you very much for, for your interest and attention, and I'll be happy to, to take questions now.